If you have your Bible with you, turn or click to Matthew chapter one. As I'm excited for these next few weeks to get into some messages regarding Christmas. Who's ready for Christmas? Who's, okay, that's a pretty enthusiastic response. I like that, I like that. So who's ready for Christmas as in you're excited for it? Who's ready as in you have all the gifts bought, all the things wrapped, all the things? No, yeah, all right. That's kind of my condition as well. I'm excited about it. And I'm glad to, looking forward these next three Sundays to jumping into some Christmas themed messages. And today we're gonna start in Matthew chapter one. And here's what we are going to read, Matthew 1, 18 through 23. In verse 18, it says this. It says, this is how... Jesus the Messiah was born. I want you to mark that it says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. And can you imagine the, the toil and everything that Joseph was having to wrestle through, the doubt and the fear and all the things that would go along with that. And it says, as he considered this, verse 20, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Let's pray over our time in the word today. Lord, we just come before you thankful, grateful, not taking for granted, Lord, the opportunity, the privilege it is really, God, to be gathered as the people of God, in the presence of God, in the house of God. And now, Lord, to open your word, which contains the promises of God. And Lord, we just invite you to speak to us, to remind us of some things today, to reveal some things, maybe in a new way or a fresh way from your word today, God. I thank you, Lord, that today you would take an imperfect message prepared by an imperfect person and you would use it in some way, somehow, Lord, reveal in a greater way the heart of a perfect father towards every person, every man, every woman, every marriage, every family, every young adult, every person in this room and joining us online. Lord, we thank you, God, today that anyone and everyone who is maybe weak or weary or wounded or hurting in this season of life, Lord, in any area of life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, God, in any way, God, we invite you here today, Lord, to be, to be a healer, to bring strength, to bring courage, to bring freedom, to bring faith for the future that every person has in the name of Jesus. And it's in that name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. So it says in verse 18, this is how Jesus was born. And I asked you to kind of mark that in your spirit. And today I wanna dig into something, answer this question, why did Christmas happen? And you know, there's a saying that we say around this time of year and I appreciate the sentiment behind it, it's true that Jesus is the reason for the, right? And so how many of you believe that that's true, right? It is true. Jesus is the reason for our season. Let me just encourage you to, um, in maybe a more determined, intentional way, to just determine and decide through quality decision that Jesus is going to be the center of your season, of your Christmas season. And, and to just make a determination to not get swept up into all the commercialization and all the hustle and bustle, some of the good things even with all the parties and the gatherings and everything, but just make a determination. It's my heart, it's my hope, it's my prayer for us that maybe more than ever, we would experience the peace and the joy as we anticipate in this Advent season, the arrival of the Messiah. So, so Jesus is the reason for our season but did you, did you know that biblically, I don't know how solid that statement is, that biblically there's a lot of things the Bible has to say about why Jesus came as a baby, why God put on human flesh and came to the earth to save you and me. And so I wanna dig into that today. If Jesus is the reason for our season, what are his reasons for this season? And we find the first one right there in verse uh, 21 of Matthew chapter one. It says that he came to save you and me. He will save 
his people, that's you and I, from their sins. So the Greek word there for save is the Greek word sozo. And it's actually far more comprehensive as it regards what God was doing through sending Jesus to that manger to save his people. And by the way, don't forget the manger happened with the cross in mind. The little baby Jesus came knowing that he was coming to go to the cross to pay the price for our sins, pride, and rebellion. And so that Greek word sozo is actually much more far reaching than what we typically think of when we say, I got saved. And, and it, it means to save, to heal, to preserve, rescue, and or deliver. So he says, I'm coming to sozo my people, to save them, to heal them, to preserve them, to rescue them, to deliver them. And how many of you would agree that there's no greater gift in this season of giving gifts and exchanging gifts? There's no greater gift than the gift of salvation, right? And, and here's what the Bible says. It's a gift. It's a gift. The Bible's very clear about this. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift, someone say free gift. Free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says the wages of sin are death. Wages are something that are earned and owed. But a free gift cannot be earned. And, and, and I just dare you to send an invoice or a receipt to be paid along with the gift that you give your spouse. That's not a gift. A gift is given freely. So it's, he's contrasting here. He's saying, what I earned through my life, through my decisions, through my pride, through my sin, through my rebellion. And, 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 and the Bible's real clear that all of us, if we say we're without sin, we're foolish. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so he's saying what I've earned with the way I've lived my life is death. What I've received through a free gift that God has given me through Jesus Christ is eternal life. John three sixteen, the most famous scripture of all time, I dare say. What does it say? It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. And the reason that we give gifts or the motivation that ought to be behind the exchanging of gifts at Christmas is it's reminding us of the greatest gift that was ever given, the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He's a free gift and he's a perfect gift. A couple years ago, I dug into this. I actually came across some research that they had done about what makes the perfect gift because how many know there's all kinds of marketing going on out there saying this makes the perfect gift, right? And they actually looked into it a little bit and here's what they found is that people that receive something that they needed, it, here, here, the perfect gift was found at the intersection of something that was needed or wanted, but for whatever reason, the person would not or could not acquire it for themselves. Either could not because of financial limitations or would not because of financial priorities in their life. And this, is, this sums up what Jesus is, who he is to us, the perfect gift. What we need becomes what we want and we could never earn it or deserve it or accomplish it in our own strength. Jesus is a free gift. His reason for the season, the manger happened with the cross in mind. You shall call his name Jesus for he will sozo, he will save, heal, restore, rescue and deliver his people, you and me from our sins. Aren't you grateful for the free gift of salvation? Number two, Jesus came, John chapter 10, verse 10, says that the thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he says, I have come. In other words, he's saying, but Christmas happened. I came to the earth. God put on human flesh. Christmas happened so that they may have, speaking of us, you and me, abundant life and life abundantly. Another translation of the same scripture says, so that they might have a rich and satisfying life. Now, it's, it's hard to overstate the importance of eternal salvation. How many of you know eternity is a long time? How many of you know that however long you think it is that we don't really have a full grasp of just how long eternity is? And that we were created for, for, as eternal spirits, eternal beings, and, and our decision, our choice about, about Jesus determines where we're gonna spend eternity. So, so I want you to hear me out on this. I am not trying to minimize or trivialize or underestimate the significance of eternal life. And you want to be found for all of eternity, worshiping around the throne of Jesus with all your friends and family 
who have also put their trust in him. It's where you wanna be, just trust me on that. But I wanna encourage you that, that God, Jesus is saying right here, but I also came so that they might experience a rich and satisfying, a full and abundant life on this side of eternity. Jesus didn't come to give his life, to live a perfect life, to go to that cross, to be beaten, whipped and bruised and beaten and broken just so that we can get to heaven. That's critically important. He didn't come and do all those things just so that we could survive this life looking forward to heaven. He came so that we could thrive in this life so that we could move from guilt to grace, anxiety to peace, fear to faith, from depression and despair to a hope-filled future, even on this side of eternity. At this time of, of year, I'm always reminded of something that occurred in our family. Five, now it's been five years ago. It just seems like it was yesterday. But five years ago on Thanksgiving Day, we had the opportunity to pray with one of Amity's family members. It was her pop and all through going up, Amity kept a prayer journal as a kid. She would write out and draw out her prayers. And I've had the chance to look through. It's really heartwarming. It's really cute. It's really fun. It's a really great idea as for, for parents to instruct our kids to do those kind of things. And most times her prayers kind of centered around her relationship with her siblings and the way that she was praying for God to change them. And, and but, 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 Consistently, consistently, one of the things that she would daily pray for was for her pop, who was a, a, an amazing guy, a big personality, a real outgoing, gregari gregarious personality, always had laughter on his lips. But it was, in some ways, he was also a little rough around the edges, and he had refused to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, despite the fact that even Amity had shared Christ with him as a child. And so every day for years and years and years, and I wanna encourage you today, maybe you have a pop in your life. Maybe you have a child or a grandchild who is far from Christ. Maybe you have someone in your life who is backslidden. And I wanna encourage you with the power of prayer, not just one-time prayer, but consistent daily ongoing prayer to pray them back into God's kingdom. And I'm just telling you, I'm so grateful that when I was the prodigal son, when I was the wayward one in my late teens and early 20s, I had a, the power of a praying mom. And I am convinced that my mother prayed me into my destiny in Christ. And so Amity would pray for years and years and years and years and even decades. And um, five years ago on Thanksgiving, we were visiting family. We had the opportunity to visit Pop. He, had, he was battling cancer and he was beginning to refuse treatments. And really what it meant is he was on his deathbed. And we went to him and we said, Pop, we said, Pop, we wanna make sure that we'll be in heaven with you and we want to make sure that you're gonna make it to heaven and now's the time. Would you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and through sincerity of heart that was evidenced by tears streaming down his faith, he prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced beyond all convincing that one day we will be reunited even though he never had a chance to write a tithe check, even though he never had a chance to be water baptized, even though he never had a chance to serve in his local church, I'm convinced that we'll be reunited with him for all of eternity. And I'm thankful for that. But I know something else is probably true. That Pop probably looks down and says, man, why did I wait? Why did I wait? Why did I miss out on all those years of being able to serve in my local church with my wife, with, with Nana, who was a regular church going gal? Why did I miss out on the opportunity to share and shine the light of Christ with my coworkers? Why did I miss out on the opportunity to be a part of discipling and raising my children to know God? Why did I miss out on those things? And, and here's the thing, I wanna encourage you today that eternity is a significant thing. It's a very long time, but Jesus came and died and rose again so that you could begin to experience heaven on earth. It's the mandate for believers. It's the way that he instructed us to pray. And I'm telling you today that there's a life of significance. There's a life of purpose. There's a life of freedom. There's a life of victory. There's a life of abundance. He said, I have come that you might have abundant life, a rich and satisfying life. And in Luke chapter two, we read more of the Christmas story that I think underlines a point that determines how much of the abundant life of Christ we receive and we experience in this, on this side of eternity. And in verse one, it says, now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria and all the people were on their way to register for the census, each to his own city. Now, Joseph also went up from Galilee 
from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. And in, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and she laid him in a manger for there was no room for them in the inn. It says there was no room for them in the inn. And I think the thing that determines how much of the abundant life we experience on this side of eternity Eternity is secured, eternity is settled. If you placed your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believed in your heart, confessed with your mouth, but I believe how much of the abundant life, the rich and satisfying life that we experience on this side of eternity is oftentimes determined by how much room we make for God to work in our lives. And there was no room for them in the end. Right from the start, part of the Christmas story is an understanding that there are many people who would not make room for Jesus. The world, it's easy to see, has no room for Jesus. But what about those of us who believe? Are we also possibly at risk of our lives becoming so filled with other things and other priorities that we miss the fullness of what God desires to do? in our lives on this side of eternity. There was no room for them at the end. It didn't stop the plans and the purposes of God. Those would not be stopped, would not be halted, would not be thwarted. It just affected who got to participate in the plans and purposes of God. And you would be surprised at how much God can and would do through you and in you if you would only make more room for him. It's obvious, it's easy to see. The world has no room for him. But once again, is it possible that we are at risk of our lives becoming so filled without room for the work of God that we miss out on the fullness of what God desires to do in our lives? And I wanna encourage you with four things that I believe are four of the most likely things to fill our life, to take the place, to fill the spot that is intended to be filled by the presence of God and the purposes of God and the power of God in our life. And number one is pride. Four things, they all start with P. And here, there's a lot of ways that pride can be expressed. There's a lot of ways that pride can manifest in our lives. But here's the angle that I wanna take today as I'm encouraging us to make room for the work of God, to make more room for him, especially in this season, maybe more than ever, with intentionality, with quality decision, with determination to say, God, I want you to work in my life. God, I don't want Christmas to just be a once a year kind of a thing. I wanna continually be living and partnering with you and your plans and your purposes for my life. And number one is pride. And here's the angle that I wanna take. And here's, it's this fear of what people will think about me. If I stand for God, if I live for God, if I begin to speak out for God and shine the light of Jesus and be his hands and feet. Mark chapter two, there's an amazing story where four friends bring a paralyzed friend and you remember they're bringing him to the place where they heard that Jesus was in the house and he was ministering and they knew that if they could get him in the presence of Jesus. And in verse four of that, that chapter, Mark chapter two, you can go back and reread it for yourself on your time. And it says this, it says that they were unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, because of the crowd. And the rest of the story is this, they didn't allow that to stop them. They pressed through the crowd and they climbed up on the house and they tore the roof off of that place and they lowered their friend into the presence of Jesus where the power of God not only healed him, but also forgave him. But, but I think there's something profoundly significant about that little statement that we could tend to kind of gloss over or miss. They could not come near to Jesus because of the crowd. And number two, it's people in our lives. People in our lives, the crowd of people, what, we th what, what will people think about me? The fear of man, the fear of rejection, the fear of being canceled, the fear of being considered some kind of a religious. I'm telling you that you've got to overcome the fear of people if you want to walk in the presence and power and purposes of God. And, and, and number two, people, dependency upon people instead of God. In other words, misplaced trust putting our faith and our trust in people. And I'm telling you today that I'm grateful for the people that God's put in my life. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the leaders that God has put around me. I'm grateful for the elders of this church. I'm grateful for you guys. But if our trust is in people around us, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how good, how smart, how godly, how righteous, how, how amazing those people are, your trust is misplaced. Even your, your trust cannot be placed in, in any person, even your spouse. 
the only person, the only uh, thing that can fill that hole in your heart, the only person that can bring a life of significance, the only person that can fully heal you and fill you is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me let you in on something. You can't be the husband God's called you to be without having God in your life. You can't be the spouse, the wife that God's called you to be, woman of God, without Jesus. And you can't raise the teenagers. You can't raise the kids. You can't do the work. You can't build the business. You can't launch the ministry without making Jesus first in your life. Dependency on people instead of God. Or also being surrounded by the wrong influences or the wrong people. And, and, and I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I feel like especially this is a challenge for young people is you're gonna to have to decide that you're gonna surround yourself with people that are gonna be God-fearing, people who are gonna be running after God, people who are gonna be chasing after God, people who are gonna put their faith in God, people who are gonna be unashamed to give God the glory for what he does in their life. First Corinthians 15, says, don't be misled. Your translation might say, don't be deceived. In other words, he's saying, many have tried and few have succeeded. He says, bad company corrupts good character. And we don't shun people. And we don't push people away, but sometimes you have to make good decisions. You have to say, are these people, are these influences, are these friends more associated with my history or my destiny? And begin to surround yourself with people who will help you to grow in your faith, who will encourage you to step towards God. So, so pride, people, misplaced priorities. Again, things that keep us from fully making room for the work of God in our lives. Sometimes even right things in wrong order can keep us from making room for God's work in our life. That's a good statement, that deserves to be reset. Sometimes even right things in the wrong order can keep us from making room for God in our lives. And, and God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have a spouse. God wants you to have a business. God wants you to have a career. God wants you to have a family. God wants you to, to have financial blessing. God wants you to have stuff. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And if you go back and you read the pretext, all the things are all the things God knows you'll need. He wants you to be blessed. But sometimes even right things in wrong order can keep us from having room for the work of God in our lives. And I see it all the time, well-meaning, well-intending, good people, godly people who miss out on the work of God in and through them because they fail to make room for the work of God because of right things in wrong order. I live for God, but I don't have the time. I'd read the Bible, I'd get connected to church family, I'd serve and lead a life group, I'd go to the women's say, I'd do whatever it was, but I don't have the time and the enemy is constantly operating through procrastination and presumption. In other words, someday or one day. But God is calling us to a life of priority and pursuit. And again, it's not necessarily that God's calling you to leave something behind or lay something down. Maybe occasionally there's those things and those times in our life. But for the most part, I've learned over the years that it's really about just making sure that God remains first and foremost in our lives. And again, you can't do and be all the things that God's called you to do and be without him being first in your life. Procrastination and presumption is the work of the enemy. Priority and pursuit is the life that God has called us to. Someday or one day is the language of procrastination and pursuit. The Bible's language is this, this day. Choose you this day. Give us this day. So my question to you is this. Are you making room in the midst of all the good things? And especially in this season, maybe more mindful, all the hustle and the bustle and the coming and the goings and the parties and the kids and the things and the stuff. Are, are you making room for the work of God in your life, in your heart, in your home? Are you making room for him? There was no room for them at the end, which leads us to the fourth P, possessions. Have you ever thought about it this way? There was no room for them in the end because business was booming. There was no vacancy. Every last room was booked. And here's the thing that we risk is that we climb the ladder of success that our culture tells us we have to climb only to look up at the end of it all and realize that the ladder was leaning on the wrong wall. And, and, and I've said this, it's been kind of a theme that the Lord's kind of woven into several of my messages recently. Poverty is not a virtue in God's kingdom. God wants us blessed. 
We need kingdom-minded business people, entrepreneurs. We need people to be blessed and prosperous, building and furthering and advancing the kingdom of God to whatever measure God has released to you. There's a desire in his heart for you to live in the blessing of God. It's not about money or amounts. It's about his provision and his faithfulness. And it's about posturing us to, just like he called Abraham to, which is now the blessing. We have to be blessed so that others can be, so we can be a blessing to others. So, so he, he wants us to be, to be blessed, but the, the challenge is this, how much can God release to you and you still require him? How, how much can God deliver to you in the form of prosperity and you still desperately need him and you still depend upon him? And there was no room for them in the end. And my question to you today is, will you make room for him in your life? Will you make room for him in your heart? Will you make room for him in your home? Number four, Jesus, or number three, rather, Jesus came to show us who God really is. So many misconceptions about who God is. Many times driven by our experiences with our earthly fathers or the unfortunate or painful experiences that we go through in life, that harden our heart towards God or cause us to begin to see him through the filter of our disappointment. So, so many opinions about who God is. And the Bible says that, that Christmas happened because God was sending Jesus to show us who he really is. John 14, verse eight, Philip said to him, speaking to Jesus, he said, Lord, Watch this, he says, show us the Father and it is enough for us. That's a mouthful, right? It's just speaking to that need, that longing, that place that we all have in our hearts, in our lives for the need for a Father. And he says, will you show us the Father? That will be enough for us. And Jesus said to Philip, he said, have I been with you so long and yet you still do not know? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And in verse seven of the same chapter, John 14, he says, if you know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And so many people think of God as distant, angry, judgmental, looking to condemn you, holding you at arm's length because of your mistakes. And, and the Bible says that Christmas happened because God was sending Jesus to show us who he really was. That contrary to our experiences or the opinions of people, that Jesus is the expression of who the Father is. And in John 8, we find one of the most compelling uh, stories about the character and the nature of who God is. When it says in verse three, as Jesus was speaking, the teachers of religious law, the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And it says they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act. And the law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? And they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger, but they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And he stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. And when his accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. I'm not sure it was as much about what they heard as what maybe they saw that he was drawing in the dust. I have my own ideas about maybe some of the things he was drawing in that dust. And I have a feeling maybe they just took one look at some of the things that Jesus was drawing because he knew their hearts and he knew the condition of their hearts, pretending to be religious, but really dealing with what every one of us deals with, struggles and toil and sin and temptation. And I have a feeling that they looked at what he, not only what he said, but what he wrote in that dust and they hightailed it out of there real fast. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, probably because the oldest were the wisest, right? until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Jesus stood up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Did you know that the story of Christmas, if you take a step back, 
and you look at it from a broader perspective, is God stooping down? It's God stooping down into the dirt of his creation. It's God stooping down into my most painful moment, your most painful moment. It's God stooping down into the moment where I'm caught in the act. I really did the thing. I I really had the thought, I really said the word, I really committed the sin. And they said, Jesus, if you'll just show us the Father. And he said, I'm I'm coming at Christmas. I'm coming as a baby. I'm coming to the manger. I'm I'm, I'm coming to put on a a human flesh suit to to show you who the Father really is. To show you that in a world that says I'm judgmental, in a world that says that I'm looking to condemn, that I am rich in mercy, I am tenderhearted, I am slow to anger, I am full of compassion, that I do not condemn, that I came to save and that I'm mighty to save. The word became flesh, John 1, and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, verse 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that our culture needs grace, but our culture also needs truth? Our culture needs grace and truth. It's who God is, it's who Jesus is. It's why he came right here. We see it when Jesus showed up, the fullness of grace showed up. And at the same time, the fullness of truth showed up. And it's time for us to once again find the moral clarity to not to care with enough compassion and conviction. We, we've got compassion for hurting people, compassion for lost people, compassion for confused people. But for the grace of God, there go I. And it was only a moment ago in my life when that was who I was and where I was in my life. But we ought to have enough compassion for them that we point them to the truth that there's a God who cares and that there's a God who forgives and that there's a God who delivers and that there's a God who saves and that there's a God who reconciles and that there's a God who transforms broken hearts. There's a God who heals minds. There's a God who will give you a new life. There's a God who will turn you around and get you going in a better direction. Our culture needs the grace of God, but our culture also needs pastors and pulpits and people to begin in the grace of God to also begin to deliver people and point people to the truth of God. Truth without grace is mean, but grace without truth is meaningless. And Jesus came full of both, grace and truth. Lastly, right here, Luke 19, verse 10 says, the son of man came, in other words, Christmas came about. That little baby via that Virgin Mary and came to that manger because God was seeking and saving the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. At Luke 15, Jesus is talking and he's telling a parable and he says, Jesus told them this story, which is what a parable is. And it says, if a man has a hundred sheep and if one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home upon his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found my one lost sheep in the same way. Someone say the same way. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. Christmas came about, the baby Jesus came to that manger because God was running after the one. He wasn't after a crowd. He already had the throne of heaven and all the angels of heaven. He he wasn't coming for a pulpit or for a platform. He was running after one person. And I promise you at some point in your life, at one point in my life, you were the one. Maybe today you are the one. So Jesus, is the reason for our season, right? Jesus is the reason for our season. 
And just hear me on that. I mean, Jesus is the reason for our season in the midst of the gifts and the gatherings and the parties and the comings and the goings, all the things that go along with Christmas. Keep Jesus at the center of it. Keep Christ in your Christmas. Jesus is the reason for our season, but I'm gonna make a statement that might kind of ruffle some religious feathers, but I believe it to be true. I believe it's what we just read. That from God's perspective, you were the reason for the season. Jesus didn't come to create a holiday. Jesus didn't come to boost the economy at the end of the year through the buying of and giving of presents and things and stuff. Jesus left the throne of heaven to come after you. When you were the one who had lost your way, when you were the one who was out there doing it, trying to live your own strength, your own way, your own wisdom, your own resources. You, was, you, were, you were the one. Jesus is the reason for our season, but aren't you grateful that you were the reason for his season? Would you stand to your feet this morning? As you stand, I wanna ask you to do what I ask you to do every week. Would you ask the Holy Spirit? And just say, Lord, what are you speaking to me? And then right there, maybe just to get yourself in a posture of stillness so that you can hear in the stillness of your heart. Maybe you might wanna bow your head and close your eyes and perhaps lift your hands as if you're in the posture of receiving or pre preparation to receive whatever God wants to do in your life in this moment. And just ask him and then just listen. Lord, what, what are you doing? What are you speaking to me? What are you reminding me of? What are you convicting me of? What are you challenging me with? What are you inviting me to? What are you healing in my heart? What are you drawing out of me? And just listen, allow him to speak to you. Where or how are you calling me to make room for you in my life, in my home, in my heart, in my marriage, in my work, in my ministry. And Lord, we just say in this season, let us be let us be a people who are making room, who are making room for you. That we won't allow pride, we won't allow the fear of people, we won't allow the possessions and the stuff, we won't allow the misplaced priorities, even the right things to become in wrong order and cause us to miss out on making room for you. Come on, would you make room for him? You'd be surprised what God could do through you. If you would just make room. Who told you? Who told you that God was finished with you? Who told you that the mistake, maybe the mistake you really made, who told you that that was forever gonna disqualify you from being used of God? Who told you that because of the divorce? Who told you? That because of the loss? The Bible also says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. That Christmas happened, the manger happened, the manger happened, the little baby Jesus came on that silent night. I don't know how silent it was with the cows and the camels and all that. But on that Saturday night, that little baby came. The manger happened with the cross in mind. And he was coming to destroy the works of the enemy. And right now, I'm telling you, whatever it is, we know, John 10 told us that the thief comes. How do you know where the enemy's working in your life? Is he, where is he stealing from you? Where is he stealing 
from you? Where's he introduced something in your life that's killing you? Where's he looking to destroy the things that God is looking to build in your life? And right there, right now, in this moment, and I, and I wasn't planning for this to go this long, but I just anticipate, I'm just sensing the Lord's doing something right now, real, a real work in, in people's hearts because of some real challenges, some real doubts, some real fears, some real obstacles, some real mistakes that people have made and that you're going through today. And right now the Lord is coming and he's destroying that work of the enemy. He's replacing the word, the lie, the deception with his word, with his heart where the enemy has lied to you about who you are in Christ, where the enemy has lied to you about who God is to you, he's coming right now. And he's saying, would you, would you just make room for the truth? Would you make room in this season for what I'm doing in your life? Would you make room, like Cage was encouraging us with earlier, for me to be the healer of your heart, for me to be the healer of your mind, for me to be the restorer in your life today. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing. And right now, whatever that is, right now, would you just, I just wanna encourage you, if you feel like that's you, God's really doing something, he's speaking to you. Anything that was just said by the power of the Holy Spirit is just kinda calling out something in your life. And, and calling you to something in your life. I wanna just encourage you, would you be bold enough to just lift your hands like this, just, just, just as a response, just as a response. And I love this posture that the Bible calls us to, the lifting of holy hands, because in one motion, we're presenting and laying something down and we're positioning and posturing ourselves to receive what God is doing in one motion. And so Lord, we just thank you, Lord whatever it is you wanna take from us, whatever it is that has kept us from having room for you, we're laying it down today. And in that place, Lord, whatever you desire to do, whatever you desire to bring, whatever you desire to speak, whatever you desire, Lord, we want it, God. We say, Jesus, we want it. You're the giver of every good and perfect thing. You're the perfect gift. And we're sorry, Lord, for caring more about the stuff and the things and the people and the fame and the followers when, Lord, all that really matters at the end of it all is well, have we made room for Jesus in our hearts and in our homes? We say, Lord, today we're sorry. And we make room for you in a new way, in a fresh way, starting today. And right there, while you continue in that posture and just continue to allow, let the Lord just lo love you and encourage you, heal you, strengthen you, whatever he's doing in your life. I wanna give people the opportunity in this moment and in the presence of the Holy Spirit to receive that perfect gift, the free gift of salvation that you can't earn, that you can never deserve even on your best day. I say it often, you don't get good to get God. God comes into your life in the midst of your darkness, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the doubt, in the midst of the fear, he, that's when he comes in. And that's when he saves us. And so if that's you, you're here and you're weighed down by life and weighed down by sin, maybe the guilt or the shame or the condemnation that the enemy uses to try to hold you in place or hinder you from moving forward towards God. Or maybe you're here today and you've drifted from God you once knew him, loved him, maybe even served him. But for whatever reason, the cares of this world, the fear of man or what people will think or say about you, you've drifted from having a relationship with him. And if that's you, Jesus told a parable in red letter words about you, about a person like you who had gone and tried to do it his own way, his own strength. And he found himself at the end of his friends, the end of himself, the end of his funds. And he said, maybe I can just go back home and maybe my father will take me back just as a servant. Maybe he'll let me just go and be a servant in his house. But if you read to reread that parable, you know the posture of the father, the heart of the father towards that wayward one who had gone and blown it all. It was far beyond just restoring him to a servant. It was making him a full member of the family. In fact, that father, when that wayward one just took one step back towards the father, one step back onto the property, that father ran 
and, and threw his arms around that wayward one, welcomed him back home, put a royal ring on his finger, a royal robe upon his back, called a royal feast for the entire community, saying, we must celebrate for my wayward one has come back home. And if that's you today, that's the posture of the Father towards you. He's not holding you at arm's length. He's just saying, would you come home? Yeah, there's some stuff we could figure out, but let's do it together. Let's do it together in a relationship that's restored. He's not holding you at arm's length. He's, he's, he's looking for, longing for, eagerly anticipating. He's right now in this moment, he's looking to throw his arms around you and welcome you back. And so, so here's what I wanna do. If, I wanna ask you to take a step. And here's the step that I wanna ask you to take, the first of many, but here's the step I want you to right now. You know who you are, weighed down by sin or having drifted from God and you need to come home. And there's no better time than the Christmas season to, to make that commitment. And right now, don't wait, don't delay. Lift your hand as high and as fast as you can up towards heaven, towards your heavenly father. You are not responding to a person or a preacher. You're responding to your father. And this is just an outward sign of the inward work that God is doing in your life. And Lord, we thank you for these precious people. These hands that are raised represents hearts that are changing, that are being healed and restored. These, these, these hands that are being raised represent pasts that are being washed clean. They represent people who are being made new. All the old things, the Bible says, they're passing away right now in this moment. You're becoming a new creation, being born again, being given a new start, a fresh opportunity, a clean slate, a new life. If you raise your hand, you can lower it. And here's what we're going to do today. We do it every week. And I hope it never grows old to you. I hope it never, you never get tired of praying this prayer because we pray it to partner with. We want you to hear the sound of brothers and sisters in Christ coming alongside you and in just one small way, just beginning to say, we're here for you. We're standing with you. We're gonna support you. We're gonna help you. If you stumble like we all have, we'll help you get up and keep moving forward towards this new life that you're discovering in Christ. But here's the other reason we pray it together every week is it just reminds us it keeps us tethered to the fact that everything God's doing in our lives, he's building our lives of faith, he's maturing us and growing us up in our faith, but everything he's doing in that regard is all built on a foundation of grace, an unmerited grace that we never could earn or deserve. Come on, many precious people came home or said yes. Let's pray this prayer with them. Come on, let's pray it boldly, maybe more loudly than you ever have before today. Repeat after me, say, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I recognize my need for a savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I can never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, I will never be the same. And come on now, put your hands together and rejoice with all of heaven. Rejoice with all of heaven. All of heaven, come on. Man. I love you. I'm praying for you. Make room. Make room. Make room for Jesus especially in this season, in this Christmas season, man, my heart, my hope, my prayer. I don't know what that's gonna look like for you if it's a season of fond memories and fellowship with family and friends, or if it's a lonely season or a hurtful season or somewhere in between. But regardless of what it looks like for you, my hope, my heart, my prayer for you is that you would make room and that you would experience more of the peace and the joy and the love, the, 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 the salvation, the abundant life, that Christmas is all about the reason that Jesus came. The reason that Jesus came, his reasons for the season. God bless you. Hey, let's worship the Lord one more time together today and then Beth will come and dismiss you. God bless you, we love you. I'm praying for you. Stand strong this week, God bless you.